Amen. Second Samuel chapter 20. Title of my sermon this evening is Sheba the Fool. Sheba the Fool. Now, there are so many lessons, as usual, in all these chapters. There are stories, so there are so many things I could hop on. That's, um, but one thing stands out, and that is the foolishness of Sheba. Uh, uh, what was he thinking? I mean, oh yeah, we're just going to fight against David now, after he just got victory over his son that caused the coup. So, I mean, what do you think David would think if you say that, or Israel would think? So that was a foolish thing to say, but let's get into it. Uh, verse 1, the Bible says, And there happened to be there a man of Belial, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. He blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tent, O Israel. A man of Belial. I mean, this guy, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit is telling us, that he's a man of Belial. So he is a reprobate. A son of Belial is a reprobate. So he's not just a son of Belial, he's a man of God. I say man of God. He's a man of Belial. Think of man of God. Now, think of man of Belial. So he's actually like Satan is like a, a priest, a man, like an imam in Muslim or something, or a Catholic priest or something. So he's not just a son of Belial. He's a pusher for it. That's why he had a trumpet with him. I mean, who just goes around with a trumpet? Maybe they all do. I don't know. But he picked up a trumpet while all the commotion was going on, and he blew the trumpet. So Belial is another word, another name for the devil. Is a, because the idols that people worship, the Bible says they are devils. Yes, idols don't mean anything. But when people are worshiping it and giving sacrifices to it and all of that, it is a devil that they are doing that to. So... So Sheba, I believe, is a satanist, is a devil worshiper. And for the fact that he's in Israel, in fact, any reprobate is a hater of the Lord. But for the fact he's in Israel, he's so much more a hater of the Lord because he knows the truth. Israel had oracles of God, the Bible says. So it says, we have no part in David. Now, he should speak for himself because rightfully so, him and his kind have no part in David. But, uh, so he's a son of Belial, he's a reprobate, but having a part in David, because the king and the kingdom, they go together. The king is David, the kingdom, like the beast, right? So when you say the beast, I'm talking about prophecy. When you say the beast, you're talking about either the king and or the kingdom. So it's one of the two, or both of them at the same time. So having no part in David, having no inheritance in Israel, he's correct as a reprobate because uh, they have no part in the people of God. So again, what was he thinking? Whether he thought this through to the end, I, I don't know. Or he just spoke out of tongue because he's a fool. You know, fools cannot control their mouth. Their, their, their tongue would lead them to death. So even if he hated David, even if he wanted a coup, he wanted to start his own revolt and have people come to him, there are other ways he could do it. But it seems as if he was seizing the opportunity to gather men to himself. That was a good point to gather men to himself. Israel and Judah, they were clashing. If you remember from the previous chapter, they were like, oh yeah, we have 10 parts in David. Uh, David should have waited for us. We should have brought David. Judah is like, oh no, David is our own. David did not pay us to do this. You know, the Bible says Judah we are fiercer than Israel. So at this point, with all the clash, he figured, instead of uniting the brethren, so Israel be under one umbrella, that's together, I should say, uh, what he did was to blow a trumpet, every gets, you know, his sandbox, right? Blow a trumpet, or a soapbox, I should say. Uh, then everyone's listening to him, he's like, oh yeah, we have no part in David, and, or the son of Jesse, you know, every man to his tent, oh Israel. So, at that point, it's easy. Israel, they were losing the quarrel, right? Because Judah was fiercer. So all Israelites are like, okay, we're leaving. We're all going home. We're not taking David back to his throne. And then Judah, you know, went on to take David to his throne. So my question, though, is where was David? I mean, all this was going on. Uh, the guy's blowing the trumpet. I mean, did David say anything? The Bible doesn't really tell us much about what David did or didn't do or what he was thinking. I mean, but I, I believe his voice would have meant a lot if David said something. I mean, it's all about you, David, because you're the representation of the kingdom that they were all fighting for. So it's, he should have focused it more on God, not himself. Oh, it's about David, or it's about the tribe of Judah, or the son of Jesse. No, it's about God. So that's what he should have done. It seems as if he was trying to be neutral. 
you know, David was in the mood of peace, peace, oh no, everybody peace, Shimei peace, uh, Ziba peace, uh, everybody, let's just, you know, be all together. No, at that point, he should have spoken up, should have said, hey, you're wrong, you're wrong, hey, let's all come together. All of us, let's go now. I mean, I've crossed over the Jordan, let's go. So Israel would have been one and not given the opportunity to this fool, uh, Sheba, to separate the people. So his apparent inaction led to a dangerous situation for Israel, creating another potential for civil war. According to Joab, it would have been worse than uh, so, uh, Absalom, what Absalom did. All right, let's look at verse 2. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba. Bible says every man. That means Israel used that opportunity to just leave the quarrel. As I said, every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan even to Jerusalem. Open to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29 verse 5. If you remember, not too long ago, in fact, if you're still looking at your Bible, you should put your finger, obviously, in 2 Samuel 20. But a few verses before that, as I said earlier too, they were crying. We have 10 parts in David. 10 parts. <laughs> there are only 12, by the way. But we have 10 parts in David. That means they have so much, they thought they had so much stake in David, or David is for us, all of that. And now, every man left David. That's all of them that said that they had 10 parts. Left David and went with Sheba. So beware of flattery. Beware of flattery. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 5, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Flip over to chapter 27, Proverbs 27, verse 21. Proverbs 27, 21. I like how the Bible describes this. It says, As defining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. As defining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. So when a man is being praised, when a man is being lavish with you know praises and all of that, that is a finding pot of silver and a furnace for gold. Well, that is a, a test for the man to see what this man is made of. Is there any value in this man? Or are we all just going to see gross? Is it all wasted? Or is there any value? Because the praise is going to test you. So, so you, be, you, first of all, understand that flattery is somebody spreading a net for you. But if somebody's praising you, hey, that's a test for you. Are, are you going to pass that test? Because the finding part is, is hot. It's a trial for you. Don't fall. Don't, you know, let it get to your head, I should say. So that's what the Bible is warning. Uh, so flesh is flesh. You have to understand that. When I was a Pentecostal pastor... For those of you that know, I believe most of you know, if not all of you. When I was a Pentecostal pastor, I was flattered. You know, I was flattered, and those same people <laughs> abused me, right? And, you know, I'm saved I'm, uh, as a Baptist pastor too. Sometimes flattered, sometimes praised and commended. And some of those same people abused me. It's like... Flesh is flesh. You know, yet you just know that this is what happens. Don't think, oh no, these are saved people, or, or oh, I know that. As long as they have flesh, be careful about flattery. Everyone is susceptible to the sin and falling for the flattery too. So be careful about that. So don't flatter. Try not to flatter. I mean, don't tell, don't, don't over give people praise that is way more than, you know, that they're doing. Like, oh, you're such a great person. You're the best person I've met. Oh, your, your voice is best or your this is that. You know, oh, in Job chapter 32, I'll read it. Job 32 verse 21. This is young Elihu, that's the youngest of the three friends, finally gets his chance to speak by, in verse 32. And in verse 21, he said, let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person's Neither let me give flattering titles unto a man, for I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. So you that are flattering, God does not like that. Now I know uh, young Elihu or the three friends were wrong. Why they were wrong is because they were accusing Job. And I'm digressing, I know, but I just want to explain that. You don't just take the whole of Job and just trash it. Oh, they are wrong, they are wrong. Let's tear that out of our Bible. No, it's in the Bible. 
<laughs> for a reason. There are lessons you can learn. But they were accusing Job, and they thought Job was, was doing something wrong, and that's why. But if you apply it correctly, then what they are saying is right. Anyway, what he was saying in this particular part is, I'm not going to give Job a flattering title. I'm not going to say, oh, he was a great guy, or this or that, because he thought Job was wrong. But he said also that if I give flattering titles, God will kill me. Like he's in the wrong with God. Like my maker will soon take me away. So that's something we should fear too. We should fear God. So be truthful. Let the, the, um, if you want to give a commendation, give a commendation. Right? So tell the truth. And if you don't have anything good to say, you don't have to flatter. Just don't speak. If you don't have anything good to say, don't speak. Your corrections should be in love. You know, with meekness, uh, you should correct somebody. Putting yourself in that person's shoes, assuming that that person too is trying. You're trying to correct somebody from anything. Maybe he, maybe he smells. He doesn't take a shower, right? You don't just go up and just. <laughs> first of all, you don't be like, ah, you know, you used to smell very great, but now the person ever smell very great. Don't flatter. Don't tell lies. Just correct and love, and don't. Ah, oh, yeah, you stink. You know. There are other ways to do it and assume that the person is trying. Maybe he just took a shower, but it wasn't working. I don't know. <laughs> so it, it, you just have to assume the person is trying. And it's not like, oh, he didn't figure it out. Obviously, he knows that he smelled it somehow. Just go that way and it might be fine. And I just picked that. I don't have it in my notes. So it's not like anyone is smelling. I just didn't know anything to say. <laughs> All right, let me give you another example. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I'll just start reading, but please open it. Acts 14, verse 11. Remember Paul and Barnabas. They were treated as gods. The Bible says in verse 11, And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of like, like Caonia, like Honia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, uh, Mercurius, because, that is Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter which was before the city brought oxen and garlands into the gate, onto the gate, I should say, and would have done sacrifice with the people. They were about to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, oxen and garlands, the, the trees and plants. They wanted to do sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas. But Paul spoke up and everything, jumped to verse 18. And with these saints, scars restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. Look at verse 18. So Paul had to speak to them. And finally, the people did not do a sacrifice. So they said, okay, you're not gods. All right, we'll not do a sacrifice, right? But I'm sure they were highly regarded of the people. Now, how fast do you think they turned on the people? The next verse. The next verse, verse 19. And there came Peter, Sheba, the son of Bico, sorry, certain Jews <laughs> from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul. Having stoned Paul. All the way from trying to sac sacrifice to him as a god, they are now stoning him. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. I mean, that, that is like a far cry from, you are God, oh, you're Jupiter, Mercurius, to now stoning him in the, just because of some Shebas, some reprobates, right? Beware of the concession, beware of dogs, the Bible says. Anyway, so this is how people are. This is how flesh is. This is what you get from flattery. So even Jesus Christ, blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Crucify him! Same people, same city. <laughs> it's, like, it's so amazing. So if it can happen to Jesus, it can happen to us. Anyway, so Judah did not leave though. So Israel, the temp, uh, Israel left with Jeshiba, but Judah, they did not leave. They decided they are not, they are not going to make the same mistake that they made that is going against the, their king. So this is still tribalism and all of that, but they stuck with their king. They are not going to betray their king. And Maybe this is why God was, God easily could separate the nations and Judah, you know, the Jews and Israel, northern tribes would be Israel because Judah is always going to stay with their king no matter what. So Judah stood by their king. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took 
the, the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in ward, and fed them, but went not into them, so they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. So remember these ten women that uh, Absalom abused, uh, made a show off in order to degrade David or to show that he has taken over. Anyway, it's sad. It's a sad situation for the women. There's a lesson. Don't be a concubine. Don't be. David did not force them to marry. Uh, so David did not yeah, force them to marry him. It's not like, oh, you must marry me or something. No. They chose to be a concubine to David. They could have said, no, maybe I should be a wife first at least. But having multiple wives too is another problem. So that's the next thing. Don't be a second wife. <laughs> right? Don't be a second wife. Especially while the first is alive. Not especially. Yeah, especially while the first is alive. But don't be a second wife. So if uh, David really loved them, he would have taken them. And he would have left servants. I want to believe, this is just my thinking, David knew about the curse that God gave him that your wives will be taken in open under the sun. So David decided, I'm just going to leave some women. If some are going to be taken, these will be the ones that will be taken. He said, oh, how somebody do that to his concubine? Have you read Judges? I mean, this is not too far from Judges. <laughs> the rule, the kind of the kings. It's not too far from Judges. So that's what they do with the concubines. And the concubines are just at their mercy. So, and he's the king too. And there are 10 of them. So I don't think he loved them as much. It was, you, you want to tell me Solomon loved his 300 concubines? 300 of them? I'm sure he forgot most of their names. <laughs> I know he's wise and everything, but he's like, don't read too many books, it's not good, all of that. Anyway, all right, so uh, David did not really love them, and um, that's what happened. So don't be a concubine, don't be a second wife while the first wife is still alive. Was David right or wrong? You see, this is a story. So what David did, he didn't go in onto them again, and he left them to live in widowhood. This is one of those situations where everyone is wrong. Everything is wrong. There's no way to make it right. Any, any move he makes is wrong. There's no godly choice for what David could have done. You say, okay, why can't he just marry them? Okay, are you supposed to have multiple wives? No. So that's a sin on its own. Okay, take them back as before. Is it still right to have concubines and to take them back and, you know, the insults with what everyone saw and degrading the king of Israel and all of that? Is that right? I mean, it's up to you. Okay, kill them then. Why did you just kill them? What did they do? I mean, <laughs> because they've been thinking about another man. I mean, what, I mean there's, there's no right answer. Okay, leave them alone, take care of them. That's what David decided to do. This is what he thought was right, you know, for himself. Because the word of God does not tell you, oh, this is what you should, you've already sinned, right? By having the concubines, having children. So this was what was just pleasing to him. So there was no right answer. What did, did David do something right or wrong? He was already wrong. <laughs> You're already on the wrong path. So it's not about did you do right or wrong. So, but he did his duty to care for them. So that's one thing. If they became concubines so that they'll be taken care of, they've gotten what they really wanted. So don't get yourself in such situations. I'm talking to the Davids and I'm talking to the concubines. Don't get yourself in such situations because there's no right answer to it. There are many situations like that you get yourself into and no matter what choice you make, it's wrong. So you just have to choose the best for you and serve the consequences. Look at verse four. Then said the king to Amasa, Assemble me the men of Judah within three days, and be thou there, be thou here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than the set time which he had appointed him. So Amasa was the guy that took over from Joab because he was the captain of the host of all of Israel under Absalom. So now he's commanding Amasa to assemble the men of Judah. Remember, all Israel went to their tent. So now it is the armies of Judah. So, and as I said, Judah, they had a comparable army to Israel. Their size, Judah had a lot of land too. Anyway, what is the lesson here? Tardiness, that is lateness, being late, uh, ju or just being lateness, basically. That's tardiness. It's the opposite of being punctual. Lateness is evident of a few things. I have five of them for you. Number one, you don't value time. No value for time. That means you don't have priorities. You don't set priorities. You think anything can just be done at any time. You're not planning. You're not thinking ahead. 
You're not planning, okay, maybe there'll be traffic or my, I didn't get it, I have a flat tire. You come out in the morning and your tire is flat. Most times it doesn't just happen overnight unless there's a problem with that tire. Most times it has been going down. And you should know, you should check. You should, I mean, there's so many things you ought to do. You're not planning, no priorities, no discipline. You're not disciplined. You, you, you probably slept late because you don't have discipline. You're like, oh, I'll soon sleep, but you're still watching something or drinking ice cream or something like that. And that'll keep you awake because it's carbohydrates. Then you're not anticipating. You have to anticipate things, that there'll be a problem and give yourself time. So that means you don't value time. That's number one, that shows lateness. Another thing is respect for others, both great and small and your equals. So he didn't respect David, David told him to be there. He didn't respect the soldiers that have assembled for you. He didn't respect his equals, Joab and Abishai. No respect for other people. You Bible says we should esteem others, guess what? More than ourselves. <laughs> More. So it tells me you don't even respect yourself. <laughs> like to be there. Another thing is pride, lateness. Uh, the uh, tardiness is it shows that you have pride. You're like, you know, everyone will wait for me. Or even if I'm there, if I'm not there, everything's still gonna work out. It's some kind of pride that no matter what, it's still gonna be fine. No, how about it's not gonna be fine? <laughs> right? How about, so it's just pride. There's a form of pride there. Another one is just blatant laziness. You're just lazy. That's why you're late. Yeah. Then get stuff done, let's, come on, move. <laughs> oh, I'm so tired, you're still rolling on the bed, turning like a door hinge on the bed, and that's why you're late, it's just lazy. Then the last one is disregard. Because, why I say disregard? Sometimes, people are late to a particular thing, right? Most of the, most of the time, they're not late to work. <laughs> So if you're late to everything, then you have a serious problem. That's, those are all those problems, laziness, no priority set, you just can't plan, no anticipation, nothing. But if you're late to a particular thing, you don't, you don't regard that thing, that thing is not important. And it, it can happen like in church. People are, will be early to work, punch in, especially the punch in work. Like, you know, yeah, make sure. I've, I've lived that life, so I know. Like you punch in, then you wait, look at the time, punch out, you know. That's how you're watching the time. But when it comes to church, you just, you know, anytime you walk in late. Or when it comes to, I don't know what it is, every other thing you go to. But walk, you take that one seriously. That means you don't regard all those things. Why? Because you serve mammon. Because you serve mammon. Mammon is what you regard. You don't play with mammon, right? So, uh, or you're not even late to your leisure. What do I mean? It's easier to miss your flight when it comes to something else, but when it comes to going to a vacation, I don't want to miss that flight. I mean, you're like five hours in the airport waiting. <laughs> because, do you know how much I pay for that vacation? I'm not missing that. But when it comes to any other thing, oh yeah, or, or this or that, you don't care. Because you don't regard that thing, but you're regarding your leisure time, your own thing, your own business. So it's disregard. It shows that you don't take this thing seriously. Now, imagine being late to an interview. You're like, okay, you don't want the job. I mean, what do you think the interviewer is going to think? Like, they're not, if they talk to you, it's just courtesy. <laughs> it's like you're 30 minutes late. 30, 15 minutes, in fact, even five minutes late. Everyone knows you park in the parking lot in the interview and wait. <laughs> Everyone knows that. You wait, then you're like, should I go in 10 minutes or seven minutes in? Yeah, you're thinking, that's your problem. <laughs> right? How, how about we take things seriously? Take life seriously. Redeem the time. The days are evil. The Bible says, walk circumspectly. All right. Uh, Amasa did half of what he was told to do. He assembled the people, but he wasn't there. And tardiness was his problem. He just tarried, the Bible says. He tarried so maybe he lost track of time, I don't know. So he was a disappointment. Look at what the Bible says in verse 6. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba the son of Bichri do us more harm than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get him fen cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab's men, and the Carithites, and the Pelethites, and all the mighty men, and they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. All right, David could not talk to Joab. 
some kind of clash going on there. Remember, without talking to Joab, he just assigned, or the Bible doesn't say he talked to Joab, but David as a king, he just assigned Amasa, the, uh, the captain of the host of Israel. Right? So there's a, what's going on here? He didn't talk to Joab, so I'm sure Joab was not too happy about that, obviously. And uh, so he went to Abishai. Abishai is another great guy. He was one of the sons of Zariah, Joab's brother. And Abishai can lead men. So since Amasa wasn't there, he went to Abishai. Okay, Abishai, you lead the men. Uh, Amasa is not here. So David not addressing the situation with Amasa. He didn't say anything about Amasa missing. He showed that he planned to address it later on. There's no way, because if he, had, if he just said, okay, Amasa has been dethroned, okay, we understand. But he didn't say anything, he just told Abishai to take over, intentionally not telling Joab to take over. So that means he's still yet to address that. So, and, um, and Sheba's situation, the fool Sheba, his situation was pressing, because you need to handle Sheba urgently. Joab's men, the mighty men of David, and all the other men that Amasa gathered, from Judah, fighting for Judah, they all followed Abishai. So what does that tell us? God uses those that are available. If you're available, God will use you. Abishai was available. Amasa wasn't available. And even though they might not be perfect, Abishai was not perfect, right? He was the son of Zeruiah, but he was always there. No matter how frustrating they were to David, Joab, Abishai, they're always there. Amasa might be the nice guy or the good guy or anything, but he was not available. So he could count on them. And that's why he just, he picked one of the sons of Zeruiah again. So that, that shows the kind of people that they are. So, but why rush to go up after Sheba? David knows what it means to be a fugitive, how the mind works, right? How his men were telling him, kill Saul and kill Saul. So this guy, being an ungodly man, a man of Belial at that, David's life was in danger. You might think your life is not in danger. Oh, yeah, he's running. Oh, I have all Israel or at least Judah. I have my throne. But this guy can come back with armies, foreign armies, right? So you better handle him now. Remember what Ahithophel said. Ahithophel said, you know, you got to go to him now before he strengthens himself and his men are rested and all of that. Go to him now and kill him. That's talking about David. And Ahithophel's advice was good counsel, the Bible says. So David used that counsel. So don't let evil fester. Open to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Don't let evil fester and grow. Evil anywhere it is. Whether it's in you or you know it somewhere else. Anything in your power to handle, by the way. So it's not just any evil you see. I'm not saying go be vigilantes. But don't let evil fester. Confront it. Get rid of it. Get rid of those evil thoughts, imaginations, all of that. The Bible says, for though, in 2 Corinthians 10, 3, for though we walk, though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So you got to handle that. You don't, you don't think about it. You know, oh, it's just my thoughts. It's just what I'm thinking about. Any imagination that uh, uh, every imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So this guy is exalting himself against the, the anointed of the Lord. You got to bring that guy down. You got to attack it now. Three days are gone. Okay, Israel had rested. They've gone to Jerusalem. Gather the men. In three days, we're going after B uh, Sheba, the son of Bichri. Verse 8. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, Amasa went before them. So the guy finally showed up. And Joab's garment that he had put on was girded about him, and upon it a girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins in the sheath thereof. And as he went forth, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Are thou in health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand, so he smote him therewith in the fifth rib and shed out his balls to the ground and struck him not again and he died. So Joab and Abishai his brother pursued after Sheba the son of Bichri. The audacity of Joab. This is whom was picked by David his lord, a small L. David his king, he, he was and he had the audacity to kill him. 
Remember Joab was not directly punished for killing Abner? Joab was not punished directly or any way in fact for killing Absalom. Why don't you think you have boldness now to kill somebody in cold blood? Even worse than the, the other two. I mean, he's so bold now. He thinks he can just kill anybody he wants to kill. That you know, he feels if there's a slight reason, I can I can give you maybe his reason, but it's the tardiness. But he can give a slight reason. Oh yeah, I ha now I have the right to kill this person in cold blood. So now, what excuse can you give for killing Amasa? So if you spare the rod, I'm talking about David now. David, you spare the rod when it comes to Joab. You were just allowing him, giving him leeway to kill Abner, to kill Absalom. Nothing being done to Joab. You didn't displace him. You didn't, no real punishment given to him. You are sparing the rod. You're spoiling the person. You're spoiling the child. And others will suffer because of your mercy. You spoil your child. Other people will suffer. Your child too will suffer. You will suffer. It's better to just spank the child. <laughs> and everybody's fine. The society, the community, everybody will be fine for that. So um, that's what happened with Abner. The person under your authority, you have to discipline that person. His deceptive skills were at another level. I mean, how many times has this guy gone for the fifth rib? Let's, I'm assuming, this is my assumption, that Abishai, uh, sorry, Joab is a right-handed man. Most people are right-handed, left-handed, uh, you know, maybe God would have said it, maybe. He's a right-handed guy, but this guy is so skilled that he used his left hand. The Bible says he had his girdle, he, and he put the sword over the girdle, right? It was fasting, and it was in a sheet. So it was coming to Abishai, uh, sorry, to um, Amasa, you know, yeah, come, let me, let me use you. You are Mesa. <laughs> you came late. Why did you come late? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so he's coming to Amesa. As he was going, the sword falls out. Right? So the sword falls out. He shot it. He probably, you know, oh, Amesa held him by the beard. I'm not going to touch you, don't worry. <laughs> held him by the beard. And I was like, oh, he's trying to greet me. Oh, to the left rib. Brought out the bowels with his left hand. So I said left rib, fifth rib. With his left hand. This guy's. He's now skilled in this. I mean, obviously, he's the captain of the host, so he has skills. But I want to look at it figuratively. His deceptive skills have increased. Look at how he got, how did he get to Abner? The same thing. Oh, yeah, I want to talk to you and stuff. Uh, how did he kill um, Absalom? That was easy. He just stabbed him. That was a fool, too. But how did, uh, but look at Amesa. Amesa, too, was a warrior coming to fight. So Amesa is like, oh, his sword fell out. Oh, he's coming to greet me. So he's picking up his sword. He's coming to greet him, holding on the beard, and... It's like, whoa, you didn't expect that. So he's a master of subtlety and cunningness to do evil. That's who Joab is. Killing his own cousin. All right. It reminds me of you betray your master with a kiss. Right? I was trying to kiss there is a greeting, obviously. It's not. <laughs> that, that goes without saying. I hope you guys understand that. So he was trying to greet him and he betrayed him. In Proverbs 27, verse 6, the Bible says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So it's sad that he didn't even know that he was his enemy, or at least it doesn't look like he knew that. So what am I trying to say again? Watch out for flattery. Watch out for flattery. He was late. Did he think that Amasa was late? Did he think that Joab was happy with him? Did he think that Joab would take it nicely that he took his position? Did he think, um, didn't he know who Joab was? Everybody knew Joab killed Abner. Everybody knew Joab killed Absalom. He killed your master that you were following. <laughs> you think he's happy with you? And you came late and he's coming to greet you? You'd be like, it's not evil surmises at this point. Right. You know who this guy is. Job, Abishai, those two guys, you watch out for them. Especially if you might be their enemy because they'll kill you in cold blood. So it is, it's um, the prudent man foresee the evil and hide it himself. You stay on your horse when you're trying to greet this guy. <laughs> and you stay away. Or make sure you know where his hands are. At least, if you're going to greet him. So... That I blame to Amesa. Oh, I'm late and Bess is coming to greet me. You shouldn't be expecting that. 
So Joab sees on the first slip up of Amasa, and his excuse will be that, oh, Amasa disrespected David. He's not trustworthy. Maybe he's our enemy. Any excuse he wants to give. So the lesson, don't give them an excuse. Don't be late. Try as much as possible, unless it is something godly, as in the case of Daniel. Don't give anybody an excuse to harm you. Daniel, he, he didn't give any excuse except in his God. I mean, he's not going to be all things to all men, even in sin or, or go against the law. He has to remain under the law. So, uh, let, so let's be warned about that. Verse 11. And one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He that favorite Joab, and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in blood in the midst of the highway. And when the man saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him when he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. And when he was removed out of the highway, all the people went after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. So what do we get from this, that, that happening right there? First of all, we see that the position falls back to Joab. There's nobody else to lead. Now Amasa is dead. Obviously, Abishai was just an interim or a substitute. But Amasa is dead. Joab is now the, the leader, and Joab knew that was going to happen. Especially in the time of war, there's no time to go back to David. Okay, so who's going to be our leader? No, they're already out going to chase uh, Sheba. So Joab thought this out perfectly. And that's how the Joabs of this world are. <laughs> you know, perfect situation, perfect excuse to take back the, being the captain of the host. Anyway, Am Amasa obviously did not die immediately. He was wallowing in his blood, right? Like the Maya wallowing in dirt or in mud. So just playing there. So I'm not saying he was playing. He was like, oh, uh, uh, you know, holding his, his balls and stuff. <laughs> it's intestine. I don't know what he brought out there. But uh, he was bleeding to death and suffering. And as his men were coming by, you know, um, the men that he assembled, as they were coming by, they all stopped in reverence or just in respect or just... Like, what just happened? I don't know what they were thinking. But they, they stopped to regard him or to pay their respects in, in one way or the other. So maybe they were shocked. Maybe they were surprised at what was happening. But what it shows me is that they were strangers to violence. That was violence. What, uh, Ab um, what Joab did was violence. Because he hurt him in malice and he was in cold blood. See, self-defense is not violence. Violence is not just anything like, oh, they're going to fight a war. What do you mean that was violence? They should be used to seeing people's guts flying out, you know, chopping up people's necks. No, when you're doing that, fighting for your king or fighting a righteous battle, that was okay, that was normal. But when you shed blood, like, or kill somebody in self, uh, uh, not in self-defense, when you kill somebody in cold blood, like Joab did, that is violence because you're violating that person. When you're fighting a war, a justified war, not all wars are uh, justified. So some wars are violent, where you, an army just invades because they want land or they want resources. Why do people go to wars? Lost, greed. So, but if you're defending yourself and you chop off somebody's head, that is back in the days, or even now, you chop off somebody's head, then that's not violence. This is what breaks into my house in the night. It's not violent, anything I do to that person. Self-defense. So God is not angry with me because God is angry with the violent man, right? Uh, he hated his soul hated him. So God is God's soul will not hate you when it's self-defense or when it's justified. But with this one, it's violent. So these people were strangers to violence, and they're like, "Did he just kill him? <laughs> like, how did he? Like, how is it?" Th they were low in the ranks, so there's nothing they could do. But I'm sure if all of them stood against him, but then they'll be standing against David. You know, who is for Joab and who is for David? So Joab played his right. I mean, for the cunningness kind of person he is and his, his subtle wisdom or the wisdom of this world, he got his position back. So we should be strangers to violence. We should not overlook when violence is done, especially the shedding of blood, because violence could go without shedding of blood, because it, it will eventually affect all of us in the land. Remember when we, uh, um, remember what the Bible says, when a man dies in the land and the, and the elders are supposed to figure out who killed a man, because they have to make sacrifices to, uh, for the blood that was shed on that land. If not, a curse to come upon that land. God will hold 
that city or the land closest to, or the city closest to the, the, uh, the dead man responsible. He's like, doesn't God know who killed the man? He should just attack that or punish that person that killed the man. No, God hold the land responsible because we all should be strangers to violence. We should um, repay, shed the man's blood, that shed, shed another man's blood. That is the law of God, right? Talked about death penalty uh, previ uh, previously. So, but now we're becoming desensitized. For example, when we hear about hurricanes, back in the days when we hear about hurricanes, everyone's like, oh yeah, hurricanes, let's give, let's give, let's help. Earthquakes, let's help. Do you think the hurricanes have stopped and earthquakes have all stopped? It doesn't happen anymore? No, they've been happening. People have been suffering, hurricane attack, houses gone, you know, people have been suffering, but now we're desensitized to it. It doesn't, it's not a big deal. There's an earthquake, okay, I mean, the news, they don't report it. Maybe they just don't want to report because it's Biden's time, I don't know. But they don't report it. So no one cares about anything else. So this is how we easily get desensitized to violence too. No one cares about violence. We see evil things happen sometimes. Okay. I'm not talking about myself here, but your phone, when that alarm goes, dun, 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 they stole another child. You're like, <laughs> do you guys even memorize the plate number and the car? Amber Alert, a white Nissan. No one remembers that. Everyone's just like, mute or <laughs> the car could pass right by you and you don't even care. Because we don't care anymore. Like, why? And I'm preaching to everybody, including myself. The last time it happened, I don't remember the car. <laughs> I'm not still looking out for the car or anything. So I just make sure all my kids are fine. Oh, yeah, we're all good. <laughs> it's not good. I'm telling you, we should all s s stand against that thing. Um, and I want, I want to make a point here, too. We're desensitized to violence so much, and time is good. But we're desensitized to violence so much that, do you remember the... Do we know the last time America declared war? In case you don't know, let me tell you. The last time America declared war as a nation, you know how we declare war according to our constitution, is the Senate that declares war, not the president. The president cannot just say, oh, we're going to fight against this person. No. The Senate all had to come together and declare war. The last time that happened was 1942, June 5th, that America declared war on Romania during World War II. Yeah. But you see, but we've been fighting all these wars. How, we, how is America involved in all these wars? UN, we're no more being, I mean, UN is now controlling everything, the forces of America. Right. Any battle that's happening, oh, UN is calling forces, UN, UN. So we cannot even say no wars, because we've not declared war on anybody, but we're fighting all these wars. Iraq war, I, I mean, <laughs> you can just list the recent wars that we fought. We didn't declare the war. UN, UN, we just, they just go through UN. And that's why they set up UN to bypass us so that they can use our resources, both human lives, the, army, the lives of Americans, our citizens, then all the millions we spend, you know, the military industrial complex. That's what UN does. And that's why violence is just spread across. Because if it's left to the people, the people will be like, oh, why are we fighting war against those people? No, we're not declaring war against them. But just want to give you guys that. So Amesa had to be covered and carried away so that the men would pass by. That is what happens. They cover the violence, they put it aside, then everybody passes by. So, which is, which is not right. I mean, don't just cover it, handle it. But I like the fact that it had to be covered. Because if he wasn't covered, they're not going anywhere. They're standing still. We're not, we're not going. So we should shield ourselves from violence, even looking at it, especially children. The knowledge of, of it being done, done is one thing, but seeing it in real time. I'm talking about pictures, videos. These days, PG, you see a whole bunch of violence. PG-13 is even, it's pretty much R-rated in my days, right? So seeing it in pictures or videos, that's another level. And this is why the Bible is in black and white. Any other thing is wrong. You shouldn't have pictures. You say, oh, I wish, I, I wish you could, a, 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 a um, Hollywood person would just make, a Hollywood director or producer would just make the Bible according to the KJV. Make a movie about the whole Bible according to the KJV. 
So tell me, how would they act Judges 19? How would they act it? Is it right? Do you think God wants us to be seeing it happen again? Like chopping up the woman and all that happened? How would they act that? The Bible is not for, for videos or pictures. It is for words. Words. And God used the right word. You say, which word should we use? It's written. The acceptable words are written. And that's how you describe it. You describe it how the Bible does. That's why a six-year-old can read it, and a 50, uh, 90-year-old can read it. It's all fine. And all the ages in between. Four-year-olds, I mean, so anybody that can read can read it. That's what I'm trying to say. It's all fine. So just use those words to describe it. Don't give videos. Don't, don't Just describe it that way with how the Bible put it. All right, verse 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Maacah and all the Berites and all the Berites. And they were gathered together and went also after him. And they came and besieged him in Abel of Beth Maacah. And they cast up a bank against the city and it stood in the trench. Sorry, and it stood in the trench, and all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. So, again, remember, Sheba the fool. Why is he the fool? He hid in a city. David, when he was running away from King Saul, hid in the wilderness. Even when he ran to a city to help that city, you know, he asked God, should I stay here? I mean, he knew that hiding in a city is, is, might not be right. But should I stay here? God said, no, these people will turn you over. <laughs> So David took off, right? David hid in the wilderness, hid in caves. He just was just hiding, or maybe in a fortress outside. He even went to Gath, went outside Israel, right? This guy did not care for the souls in the city, or he was foolish to think that they would care for him. So he was ready. Uh, he wasn't ready to suffer in caves. Oh, I'm going to hide in the city with men and stuff. He wasn't ready to leave Israel, although he was a reprobate. The son of Belial. So what is he doing in Israel? This is an easy chance for him to just go to Gath or any other city around. But he wasn't ready to leave Israel. It reminds me of some Americans when Trump was president. Oh, he's not my president. Okay, leave. If he's not your president, then you're not of this nation. <laughs> how about you go to Canada and see how life is there or something? Or, or Sweden or any Scandi Scandinavian country that you think has the best health care and the best this and the best that and the best everything. You know, go to that country. But he decided to stay there, right? So he wasn't ready to s sacrifice anything, but ready to sacrifice the souls of those men or, this, or that city because David's men was going to bring down that city. They were battering the walls. They've already set up a bank. They were not going to let him go. And Joab, obviously, would want to come back with his head because that's the only way to please David after killing Amasa. So you can see Joab is a man with, um, with a goal here. Anyway, look at verse 16. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say, I pray you unto Joab, Come near hither, that I may speak with thee. When he was come near unto the woman, the woman said, Are thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then said she unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Then she spake, saying, they were wont to speak in old time, saying, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel, and so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Remember, we have no inheritance in David. But anyway, just want to remind you of that. All right. So we know the story. The woman comes at the wall, calls on, on, on Joab because she knew. In fact, she calls on Joab. Did she even know that Amasa was dead? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe she knew. I don't know. But she calls on Joab, the captain of the host, to speak with him. And they had that conversation. So she said that city was a city with wise counselors. So there was a time where, according to her, people would go to that city to get counsel. Maybe there was a quarrel or something, and the matter will be ended. That means there will be a solution to that matter. So there are wise people that dwell in that city. And she's saying she's one of them. Peaceful and faithful. So you see what the wisdom of God brings. Peace. Right? In James chapter 3 verse 17, excuse me, it says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and of good, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So what I want to highlight is, it is first pure. 
Yes, she's one of the peaceable ones and she's faithful in Israel, but the, the wisdom from above is first pure. This fool went to hide in a city where they had wisdom from God. And a city where they count themselves as part of the inheritance of the Lord. <laughs> that's where Shema went to hide. Of all the cities in Israel. Maybe that's how all of them are. But this particular one had wise people in it. So peace does not mean to harbor evil or to condone evil. You don't have to harbor it. You don't have to condone evil. Oh, you know what? We just want to have peace with everybody. All the pride people. Just, just peace. That's not what peace means. And look at what she did. She said she's peaceable. And look at what she, we all know the story. So wisdom can save a city. Speaking of violence, in, uh, I think in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we'll not read that, but Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the Bible says a poor wise man could save a city, right? He will save a city, but nobody will regard him because he's poor. But the point is one poor wise man can save a whole city. And this woman, I won't say she was a poor wise woman. She was probably listened to because I'm sure there were all guards there. She wasn't like commanding the army. Men do that. But she went to the war and she spoke to Joab. So the woman was advising the city. She wasn't necessarily the ruler of the city. She wasn't like Deborah, right? She was advising the city and uh, she was probably, uh, she was not, sorry, she was not a judge of the land. Uh, there was, uh, that's Deborah. She was not a judge. There was no judge. All she did was step up. If a woman steps up because the men are not stepping up, I don't blame the woman. The woman is not at fault. It is the men you should look at. You say, uh, what happened to all the men? Look at who God picked. God picked Barak. Barak was the best man he could find because God picks usually picks the best person that is available and all of that. Barak was the best guy. Look at how he was. He was, he was weak. <laughs> he was afraid. He's like, oh yeah, you have to go to battle with me, all of that. That shows you how weak all the men were. Because another man would be like, what are you doing? I mean, I'll do it. But no man could step up to the plate. It looks like even Deborah's husband. But God chose Barak. And um, it, shows, it shows you that God will still pick a man, no matter what, to rule and to lead. Because if it's done by the Lord, the man is the head of the wife, the Bible says. So women should not rule. How can they rule? Because the husband, as I said, is the head of his wife, right? And daughters are under, the, under their, their fathers. And the father is supposed to hand over the daughter in marriage, right? So dot, women are always, always under men unless they are widows. And I don't think many women are like, you know what, I want to be a widow. I don't want to be under a man. You know, if, if there are people like that, then too bad, I guess. But women are always under men. So they should not even vote. I know it's crazy, but think about it. Why should they vote? Because they should first try and convince their father or their husband. So if they can't convince their husband, why do they want to go around him to vote something different from what he's voting? But then you say, well, what if they vote the same? Let them all vote the same. Why are they all voting the same? That's why they will not count all the ballots by the end of the day, right? I mean, if we just had the men voting, they would have finished counting the ballots. <laughs> all right, I'm digressing. But Isaiah chapter 3 verse 12 says, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy path. So, women ruling over them, if you read the context there, the uh, Israel then were in sin. And, and God was punishing them. Children are their oppressors, and women ruling over them. So, the weak authority in the city caused Sheba to run there in the first place. If there are no men that will come out and talk and stand. That's why Sheba probably ran there. So, and they wanted to fight for Sheba. Because they should have opened their doors. Oh no, we don't know that guy. But no, they closed their doors. They set up the banks. You know, trenches. You know, you think it's easy to dig trenches. So these guys were ready to fight for Sheba. If not for this wise woman that saved most of their lives. Because Joab is not living there without the head of Sheba. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 19 says, Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. So that one woman, she, she's stronger than ten mighty men. So because with her wisdom, she could save the city. Look at verse 20. And Joab answered and said, Far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. <laughs> this guy that just finished killing somebody. <laughs> If you just swallow up and destroy, if you can do it to one, he would have done it to the whole city. 
Do you think Job is going to leave that city? No, he will break. He will burn down that city until he gets uh, Sheba. So that's who Joab is. But once he gets Sheba, though, he will stop because he showed that with Absalom. Verse twenty-one. The matter is not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, had lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. So Joab had no choice but to answer accordingly. Joab cannot go there and say, Oh no, I want to kill everybody here for supporting Sheba. Because the wise woman, the way she, she asked Joab the question, Are you going to swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Like, why are you coming here to kill us? What did we do? We're, we're God's own children too, right? We're brethren. So Joab had to be smart, right? Or had no option. Because he, if she, if the woman said, you crazy guy, you know, curses him and all of that and says, what are you doing here? We have our rights, you know. <laughs> if she did all that, Joab would say, you are supporting somebody that is against the king, so all of you will pay for it. So mind the words that come out of your mouth. With her words, she could bring Joab down only to go for uh, Sheba, the son of Bichri. So Joab knew, cut off the head of the snake, and all the other men will fall in line, right? Like we did with Absalom. So the power of words is very important. Proverbs 25 verse 11 says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. I like that verse. I'm going to use it every time I can get. So use, use your words with power. Like use it. The right time, the right words, the right tone, everything, apples of gold and pictures of silver. Fitly spoken. The same Proverbs 25, 15 says, By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. The Bible says the righteous, his bones will not be broken. But I'm just trying to show you the, 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 um, the figurative meaning of soft tongue can break the bones. That's why I said a wise person is stronger than 10 mighty men. So mind how you talk, how you use your words. You can persuade a prince that is a ruler. And you can break a bone. So this guy was just brought to the correct level by her. That is, I'm talking about Joab. Proverbs 15 verse 1 and 2 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. Alright, verse 22. But the, wo but the woman went unto all, sorry, then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom. I like that. Anyway, let's, let me finish up. Went all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, and the son of Bichri, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. So she did not just command the people. As I said, she was not a ruler of the city. She was just a wise person and a wise advisor or counselor in that city, just like Deborah was. So she went and she reasoned with the people. This is why I said what I said. This guy, I, I, I don't know what she said exactly, but she reasoned with the men. And they dis Do you think she took Sheba and cut off his head? No. <laughs> That's not how it happens. You know, the men, you know, Sheba was like, whoa, whoa, she's wrong. I don't know what happened. But then it just held him, chopped off his head. They're like, we're not going to kill our sons. She's, she's right. You know? Um, so then... Joab asked for him to be delivered, and she delivered the head. And I think that was trying to make a statement that, that she was doing. And she made the statement by throwing the head over as per, yes, we don't stand for evil, so don't harm us. We've given you what you want, so you should leave. Joab did not set a foot in that city. A foot in that city. Over the wall, she threw the head. That is how wisdom can save a city. If you had told them that, oh, Joab is not entering that city, everyone has said no. But with wisdom and with words, the city was saved and all Israel learned a lesson. Don't go and hide in some city, your head will be chopped off if you're going against David. So this is how dangerous fools should be handled. Number one, by David. You handle it fast and quick. Don't let evil fester because he might be a fool, but he's dangerous. So don't think fools, oh, it's just a fool, let's him. No, 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 it can, it can be very dangerous. Then by Joab, Joab was hell-bent on getting this guy, digging trenches, but all he wanted was his head. Then by the wise woman, don't have a fool. 
a dangerous fool, you will suffer for it. So this was for all to hear and to fear. All right, the last few verses says, Now Joab was over all the host of Israel. He's gotten his position back. And Benaiah, the son of Jerada, was over the Carithites and over the Pelithites. And Adoram was over the tribute. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And, and Sceva, or Shiva, was scribe. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira, also the Jairite, was a chief ruler about David. So now the two conspirators have been killed, Absalom and the fool Sheba, the son of Bichri. The kingdom of Israel is now again reestablished under David. That's just what these verses are saying. And it's a nice way of removing the bitter taste from the last battle, killing of Sheba. Remember the last battle was Absalom dying. Now. What is bringing David back to his kingdom? The army is returning, rejoicing. The head of Shiva, uh, sorry, of Sheba. That is um, a perfect, you know, sweet taste to the people. And David is now rejoicing. His kingdom is now established. So it just kind of lifts up the spirit. When everyone is rejoicing, they're coming back victorious. Not one man dead, except Amasa. But because they didn't, they didn't really fight any war. They just went searching for him, and they came back with his head. I mean, that is the best. <laughs> because David did not want more bloodshed. David did not want all that. So it was sad to see another civil war, but that was avoided. So don't follow fools against the anointed of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us.